the word of the Lord from Psalm 18. Of the servant of the Lord David, who spoke the words of this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all of his enemies and from the power of Saul. He said, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. The ropes of death were wrapped around me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. I called to the Lord in my distress, and I cried to my God for help from his temple. He heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the mountains trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils, and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down, total darkness beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, dark storm clouds his canopy around him. From the radiance of his presence, his clouds swept onward with hail and blazing coals. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. He shot his arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He pulled me out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not turned from my God to wickedness. Indeed, I let all his ordinances guide me and have not disregarded his statutes. I was blameless toward him and kept myself from my iniquity. So the Lord repaid me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the faithful, you prove yourself faithful. And with the blameless, you prove yourself blameless. With the pure, you prove yourself pure. But with the crooked, you prove yourself shrewd. For you rescue an oppressed people, but you humble those with haughty eyes. Lord, you light my lamp. My God illuminates my darkness. With you, I can attack a barricade. And with my God, I can leap over a wall. God. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock? Only our God. God, he clothes me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me securely on the heights. He trains my hands for war. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand upholds me and your humility exalts me. You make a spacious place beneath me for my steps, and my ankles do not give way. I pursue my enemies and overtake them. I do not turn back until they are wiped out. I crush them, and they cannot get up. They fall beneath my feet. You have clothed me with strength for battle. You subdue my adversaries beneath me. You have made my enemies retreat before me. I annihilate those who hate me. They cry for help, but there is no one to save them. They cry to the Lord, but he does not answer them. I pulverize them like dust before the wind. I trample them like mud in the streets. You have freed me from the feuds among the people. You have appointed me the head of nations. A people I had not known served me. Foreigners submit to me cringing. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners lose heart and come trembling from their fortifications. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. The God of my salvation is exalted. God, he grants me vengeance and subdues peoples under me. He frees me from my enemies. You exalt me from my adversaries. You rescue me from violent men. Therefore, 
I will give thanks to you among the nations, Lord. I will sing praises about your name. He gives great victories to his king. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I urge you now to take a copy of the scriptures and turn to Psalm 18. If you're using the Bible under the seat in front of you, it's on page 479. Psalm 18, 479, the Bible in front of you. Is God's word relevant for us today? It's easy to give a quick answer, yes. But that's a question that not many in our society would give such an answer to. So I'd like you to look at Psalm 18, look at the heading that Carlos read for us before he got into verse 1. The heading says this, Of the servant of the Lord, David, who spoke the words of this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him, from the grasp of all his enemies, and from the power of Saul. This same psalm is found repeated in its entirety, almost word for word, in 2 Samuel 22. It's located there immediately before David's final words, before he dies. But look at here in the heading. We have David, a servant of the Lord. And he tells about experiencing conflict, and he tells about deliverance. Well, many of you in this room would claim to be a servant of the Lord. You follow Jesus. You seek to make the glory of God known through the constellations of his attributes and his actions. So there's an overlap between you and David right there. And he tells about experiencing conflict. Well, each one of us has experienced conflict to one degree or another this week. And he tells about deliverance. Now, the reality is we don't like holding the first two ideas together. Servants of the Lord and conflict. If we serve God, why do we experience conflict? And if we are experiencing conflict, how can we know for sure that we're actually serving and following God? Now, regardless of your faith or your religious belief, we can all agree that conflict exists. And if we we have ears to hear, the Spirit of God has something for us to learn this morning about conflict, deliverance, and our role in conflict as we wait for deliverance. So we're going to use this roadmap to make our way through the psalm this morning. Three realities regarding conflict, two facts focused on deliverance, and one tension to keep in conflict. So first, three realities regarding conflict. The first of those realities is quite basic. Life is conflict. Anyone who tells you differently is a liar. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, you know this to be true in your own experience. Just when your home life seems to move into some semblance of normalcy, something in the extended family causes conflict. Or there's a disagreement at work, Or something internally begins to stir to the point of deep frustration and emotion. The Bible tells us, and your experience affirms, there are at least four layers of conflict that we endure. Conflict within ourselves, dealing with what's going on inside of us. Then there's conflict among ourselves, dealing with disagreements and misunderstandings and sin and suffering and story, and then conflict between God and men is the third layer, and then finally, conflict between man and the rest of creation. 
And if you're a skeptic of the Bible, at least acknowledge its realism. There isn't one page of Scripture that allows you to view life through rose-colored glasses. Life is conflict. And that's true for you, isn't it? It doesn't matter if you follow Jesus or not. Our sin nature and the weakness of our human nature creates misunderstandings and conflicts among us and within us, and our circumstances often put us in a position of feeling like we are in conflict with God. And in reality, as sinners, we are. And since the curse... We are in conflict with the very creation around us since the fall of man. Has anyone seen the show on Discovery Plus called Growing Florette? Absolutely no one. My wife and I are the only two. So we've watched this show. It tells the story of a flower farm in Washington State. Yes, guys. I watched a show about a flower farm in Washington State. The visuals are stunning, and the flowers are truly beautiful. In one of these episodes, the founder of the farm, Aaron, describes how they tried to give nature back part of the farm by replanting one whole field to be a meadow. What it used to be, they're trying to turn it back to that. So they plant shrubs surrounding the field to invite the birds and the animals back and restore the ground so it could be used perhaps in generations. And it was such a good idea. And it was beautiful as the the meadow grew, but then the rabbit showed up and began eating the cultivated gardens and the baby flowers. And the deer helped themselves to the all-you-can-eat stand-up buffet that is that flower farm. And then the coyotes show up to eat the rabbits, and they destroy the irrigation system for the rest of the farm. Beauty and conflict. This is life. Did you hear the conflicts that David experienced as Carlos read Psalm 18 for us? And before we get into who he found God to be for him in the midst of that conflict, notice what he believes he needs in just the first couple verses. He believes he needs a fortress, a deliverer, a shield, a God who can deliver, a stronghold, a horn like the horns of an ox capable of defending against attack. In David's experience, This is what David believes he needs. Why? Because life is conflict. Perhaps you've been told something differently. Maybe even by someone claiming to be religiously enlightened. Follow this financial advice and you will avoid conflict. Be disciplined. Follow these steps and you will avoid conflict. Parent this way, and you will have this golden relationship with your children and avoid conflict. Read this book, follow these steps, listen to this voice, avoid conflict in area A, B, or C. But maybe you're sitting here and thinking, yeah, but it didn't work for me. You followed the program, you listened to the voice, you read the book, and you ended up in conflict. Maybe your financial situation is a wreck, or your marriage is in a rocky spot, or maybe you're lonely and isolated and your family relationships are on edge. And in your mind, you have former preachers and teachers and philosophers and authors calling you out. If you had just done A, B, C, D better, everything would have worked out. Friends, it's time to lay down that guilt and shame. 
And the process of doing that begins with agreeing what God has said throughout Scripture. Life is conflict. But there's a second reality concerning conflict. Conflict feels like death. Doesn't it? David affirms this. Verse 4 and 5. The ropes of death were wrapped around me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol, the grave, entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. Conflict feels like death. If you grew up in a church context that sang some of the revival praise choruses, perhaps you remember the song, Just As I Am. There's a line in that song that goes, fighting within and fears without. Conflict. Conflict feels like death, destruction, sheol, the grave, ropes, snares, entanglement. The Net Bible, the New English translation reads this way, at the end of verse 5, the waves of death engulfed me, The currents of chaos overwhelmed me. I wonder if the currents of chaos feel like they're overwhelming you right now. What is that one conflict that feels like death to even look at in your life and experience? What is that one area of disturbance in your existence that feels like you would drown if you began to engage in that conflict. Maybe it's with someone else, a spouse, or a child, a co-worker, a neighbor. Or maybe that conflict is internal. Maybe it's facing a wall of guilt or shame or fear that's in that one corner of your soul that you don't dare go knock on. Or maybe it seems to be a conflict with the providence of God in your life, where he's brought you and how he's led. And it just doesn't make sense because conflict feels like death. And in reality, that's appropriate. Conflict feels like death because man's conflict with God conceived death as its child. And so death has passed upon all of us. And so we have fightings within and fears without. Our final ultimate conflict with our created bodies and with the God against whom we have offended, that final conflict is our approaching death. Life is conflict. And conflict feels like death. Third reality, conflict leaves us looking for deliverance. Look look at verse 6. Look at what David does. In my distress, I called. I cried out. Where do you turn for deliverance in your conflict? Read an article this week from The Hill that reported this stat that the average American drinks 2.5 gallons of ethanol, that's the alcohol used in alcoholic beverages, every year. Two and a half gallons of ethanol per person in our country. For much of our culture, Our deliverance in distress, the Savior from our chaos, is happy hour. And if alcohol is not your deliverer, what is? In your distress, when you are rocked by the currents of chaos, who do you look to? To what do you turn for deliverance? Maybe it's entertainment. Maybe it's education, bettering yourself. Maybe it's achievement. But the third reality is this. Conflict leaves us looking for deliverance. 
So let's pause for just a moment. If you are a follower of Jesus, these three realities described your life prior to coming to Jesus. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you may resonate deeply with these three realities. But even for those of us who are in Christ, who follow Jesus, while we wait for final redemption, we experience these three realities to varying degrees still, don't we? Life is conflict, conflict feels like death, and we look for deliverance. So next, two facts focused on deliverance. And the first fact is this, deliverance is possible. Look at verse 6. I called to the Lord in my distress. I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. So in his conflict that felt like death, David turns to the source of his deliverance. He's already called God his strength, his rock, his fortress, his deliverer, the one in whom he seeks refuge, his shield and the horn of his salvation, his stronghold. And what happens next in the psalm? What follows is one of the most fearsome portraits in all of scripture of the all-powerful God on the move to deliver the one who cries out for his deliverance. You've already heard it read once, but it deserves repeating. Just listen for a moment. Close your eyes if you need to, to focus on the power of God in these verses. Verse 7, Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the mountains trembled. They shook because he, God, burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down total darkness beneath his feet he rode on a cherub and flew soaring on the wings of the wind he made darkness his hiding place dark storm clouds his canopy around him from the radiance of his presence his clouds swept onward with hail and blazing coals the lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. He shot arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. The depths of the sea became visible. The foundations of the world were exposed at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Deliverance is possible because God is all powerful. Can you imagine anything else for a moment to compare to any degree with the power of God as described in these verses? It's almost like David is playing a game of one up and he wins hands down. There is no one who can speak up after this description and say, yeah, but I can top that. I wonder, can your wanderlust experiences deliver you like this? Can your 401k and stock prices deliver you from conflict with this kind of power? Can your peer affirmation in the workplace or on social media de- media deliver you to a place of feeling like you are actually okay? Can your coping mechanisms or your conflict withdrawal or your status building or your achievements, do they have this kind of power to deliver you? Deliverance is possible because God is all-powerful. Second fact, deliverance is possible because God is personal. Look at verses 16 and 9 through, or 16 and 19. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. 
he pulled me out of deep water. Verse 19, he brought me out to a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Some of you need to sit in verse 19 until the word of God enters your soul like 220 volts of electricity with this reality. God is a personal loving God. Sometimes we try to pit God's attributes against each other, don't we? Well, he's holy. Oh, no, he's love. Well, you got the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, as if they are in tension. But in this psalm, we see that God's essence is power, and simultaneously, God's essence is love. There is no tension And God's love issues forth towards his people in what? Delight. Child of God, do you believe God delights in you? But how can we be assured that God will rescue us in this sort of way from the conflicts that we experience? How do we know he will be our rock in conflict as he was for David? Well, up to this point, we've been thinking of David in terms of an individual. David, the person. But David wasn't just a poet who had trouble and put it down in a poem. David was also the anointed covenantal king He was chosen by God to lead God's people. And so verses 20 to 24 describe how David kept his covenantal obligations to God as God's chosen king. So that's why David can say, I've been blameless and righteous. Is he claiming perfection? No, he's claiming that he has kept his kingly covenantal obligations as laid out in passages like, Deuteronomy 17. And David says that this is the basis that God answered him because he had kept his end of the covenant. Now follow this for a second. David, God's chosen king, follows God's covenantal obligations as king. So who is ultimately going to benefit from King David's obedience. Is it merely David? No. It's all of his subjects. All of King David's subjects are going to benefit from the covenantal king's obedience. Christian, are you hearing any parallels? Jesus Christ is the greater King David. He was blameless and righteous. He fulfilled with perfect obedience, not just the covenant obligations of kingship, but of the entire law of God. Why? So that all who claim him as king might benefit. He is the covenantal king. And he's the covenantal king who has been given the conquering in conflict. God delivered David, and so God delivered King Jesus from his conflict, and God, through the covenantal king, will always deliver his people in conflict. Church, David's story models our own. His experience points beyond King Jesus, who secured our deliverance, and his experience points us to the whole of God's people who then benefit, benefit from King Jesus' deliverance. As we've already sung this morning, Jesus has conquered death for us, 
He's already conquered sin for us. He's already secured a conflict-free future in which we will always only ever be at peace with God and at peace with one another and at peace with ourselves and at peace with all of creation. That's where the story is headed. So Christian, individually, this psalm parallels your own story. Conflict, death, deliverance. And yet, you still experience ongoing conflict, don't you? Conflict still exists, and painfully so. And that brings us to finally one tension to keep in conflict. And the tension is this. The war has been won, but warfare must be waged. The war has been won by our covenantal king. He has conquered in the conflict. And yet, warfare must be waged. Remember when God brought Israel out of Egypt and he brought them through the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and brought them to the edge of the promised land and he told them, this is your land, it's yours. But what did they have to do? They still had to fight for it. This land had been promised hundreds of years earlier to Abraham. Rest was now theirs. But under the leadership of Joshua, each tribe had varying degrees of success to live out the victory that was theirs to enjoy. And so the author of Hebrews reminds us that there is a rest still waiting for the people of God to enjoy. The conflict has been won, but there is yet work to be done. And the text bears this out. Verses 30 to 36 are filled with the assurances of victory and peace and security. But you get to verses 37 through 42, David is still active. And so are we in our covenantal king. He is our conqueror, or he has conquered and is yet conquering. The war is won, but warfare must be waged. Notice how David ends. Look at verse 46. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. The God of my salvation is exalted. God, he grants me vengeance and subdues people under me. He frees me from my enemies. You exalt me above my adversaries. You rescue me from violent men. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, Lord. I will sing praises about your name. He gives great victories to his king. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Christian, you show up in verse 50. Did you see that? Because you are in the greater David, you are one of his descendants whom the Lord will show loyalty to forever. The greatest of all victories has been given to this final Davidic king, Jesus Christ. And God has showed you his loyalty And if you are not yet in Christ Jesus, you can be united to him by repentance and faith, simply by grace, through faith. But let's remember, warfare must be waged. So what does that look like specifically? Well, first, Christian, it touches our heart. It touches us us at a heart level. So let me ask you, Christian, has the ease and distractions of our American way of life, a vanity fair of epic proportions, has it detoured you from the cultivation of health in your own soul so that you can courageously engage in the conflict around you and within you? Christian, are you in light of Christ's victory doing battle against the conflict of the sinful desires within you? Or are you on cruise control? 
Or maybe you've embraced a fatalism that says your relationships will always only ever be conflict, they will never get any better. Or the fatalism that says your sins and failures are too great for God's redemptive power, and therefore you've refused to even engage in attempts at reconciliation. Or you've refused to engage in steps towards your own spiritual formation, taking head on the conflict within your soul. Or maybe you're avoiding dealing with issues from your past, knowing the pain and difficulty that that internal conflict will bring, thinking perhaps it's just too challenging, too much to face. Friends, the war over sin, death, guilt, and shame, it's been won by our Savior. He's conquered it. So today we can engage in that warfare with confidence through his grace without fear. But it affects not only our heart, but our hands. This waging of warfare is not political and it's not cultural. We don't do battle against flesh and blood as Paul will remind us later. David did, even in this psalm. But as New Testament Christians in Christ, our conflict is not with other human beings. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. Ultimately, the conflicts we engage in are not primarily directed at other humans. We are given the armor of God to wage warfare, the word of God, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the chest protector of righteousness, the belt of truth. And these become the means by which we engage in warfare. So let's not forget, church, as we enter another political season where well-meaning Christians will be tempted to take up social media and other cultural weapons in an effort to do battle when we'll be tempted to adopt societal norms for waging war against enemies that are not our true enemies. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. But maybe for some here, the application is focused on your head, the life of your mind. Christian, most likely your workplace connects in some way to those four layers of conflict that we are engaged in. Whether it's the deterioration of our bodies as experienced in the medical professions, or the injustices we commit against each other as experienced in the the legal professions, or the brokenness of the world and our need for shelter and security as experienced in the insurance professions and the construction professions. Or maybe you see that conflict in the brokenness of minds and bodies torn apart by sin and suffering in social work and counseling services. Or maybe for you, it's in the raising up of a new generation of thoughtful and creative human beings who are committed to our Lord and determined to love Him and their neighbor regardless of the cost as you parent faithfully. So Christian, what if you started looking at the responsibilities in front of you tomorrow as your kings call upon you to engage in what he is doing, to join him in waging war against all of the destructive forces that cause conflict within and the conflicts among us. That is God's calling on our lives, Christian. And as a New Testament follower of Jesus, you bring the presence of the covenantal and conquering king into every space you enter by the Spirit of God. Imagine how that reality would change your perspective entering into conflict. It wouldn't make you more combative or jerkish or domineering, but you would lean into the courage the peace given by God's Spirit, 
you would see yourself drenched in God's grace, ready to engage in the conflict. Because life is conflict. Conflict fears like death. Conflict leaves us longing for deliverance. Deliverance is possible because God is all-powerful and a personal loving God. He's appeared to us in Jesus Christ, our covenantal king, who always conquers in conflict for his people. The war has been won, but warfare must yet be waged until our king returns in glory. And who knows? Maybe that'll be today. Maybe it'll be next month, next year, or next decade. But until he comes, may he find us here at Sojourn Church faithfully engaged in the conflict for his glory and by his strength. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask for your grace to believe what you have said from your word. Father, help us to believe that Jesus Christ has actually conquered on our behalf for us, not just our sin, surely that, but our guilt, our shame, our fear, Father, he has conquered to a degree that one day there will be no more conflict. We will enter the peace that you designed us to live in and experience. True, holistic well-being. But Father, until that day, give us courage not to withdraw from conflict, but to engage in it faithfully, with courage, with compassion, with conviction, drenched by your grace, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, so that Jesus Christ, our conquering covenantal King, might be glorified. We pray this in his name. Amen.